Hey YouTubers, and welcome to another episode of the Samurai Monkey 42. In this video, I'm going to be talking about Japanese NCO swords. A lot of YouTubers asked me to make a video on Japanese NCO swords, and also my friend Kenneth Shepard in Belgium, who also supports my videos and buys things from my eBay store, the Samurai Monkey 42. So, to talk a little bit more about Japanese NCO swords, I have this early Type 95 NCO up here, and it's in great condition. This NCO swords were massively produced by the Japanese government, so there are many, many of them. They were first approved by the Japanese government in 1935 and then released in 1937. They were very massively produced to obviously supply a lot of soldiers with the sword during the war. Now, there are many, many different types of them, and a lot of them look different because there were a lot of different companies producing this NCO sword during World War II. But this is the most standardized prototype that you will see. Just so I'm going to talk about first the handle. The first production of the handle was made in copper. But a lot of collectors know it as the copper handle. And this was when the Japanese government had a lot of materials. So they started using copper handle and I believe that this source didn't have any paint because I've never seen any traces of paint on them so it was all copper and one of the features that it was later changed during the war don't see the screw here you only find the screw here on this side and I believe this happened the Japanese were always trying to uh, better their weapons I believe one the, the that this change due to the fact that if you only have one screw here and nothing here the sword would get sort of loose with time. So they decided to implement another screw here, maybe to make the handle more tight and not become loose with, with time. So the first 6,000 were made out of copper and later they just started using aluminum. Now, something you guys need to know about aluminum is it doesn't hold paint very well. So the example that I have right here has a lot of its pain is still left. So that's what collectors are very interested in is how much, whether it's an early edition and whether it has almost all the pain is still left. Also, the pain is still left here on the cherry blossom decoration here. That's also very important. Another thing I wanted to mention is um, some of them, the with the first, the copper handle, instead of having this wire piece, they will have a leather strap instead. A leather loop around here. I never seen one. Well, I seen that leather loop on Chingonto swords, never on a Japanese NCO sword. So as you can see, this one still has almost like ninety-five percent of the paint. There's more paint on this side. It's in great condition. And let's move up further from the store. The Fuki here tells you the <clears throat> the companies that were uh, making uh, the sword at the time. This two, the one on here on the left and the one on the right are companies that were making this sword at the time. And the one in the middle here is the Tokyo First Inspection Administration that stamped this, approving this sword. You can see the clip here on the side. So now let's talk about the Suba. The Suba didn't really change much. Um, it, it's always been made out of brass, even for the uh, first copper handle. It, it, this is my favorite Suba. This is, this is my favorite uh, decorated tsuba. It didn't really change much. Uh, later production, when the Japanese started running out of materials, they started using iron instead of uh, round iron tsuba with no decoration or black. And almost at the very end of the war, the NCO swords still have this look, had a iron fuki, and also has uh, they stamped the iron fuki, but iron is harder than copper so the stamps that you see on those iron fuki ones would be very very light almost nothing there because they weren't they weren't really able to stamp the hard steel so tubas tubas didn't really change much they stay almost the same and let's move up to the scabbard now you can see this one is missing a little bit of the paint you're also you're always going to find green olive with the scabbards they really never change that. Some of them have, have a brighter color 
and some of them have a darker color and it is obvious that some of them are going to be missing some of the paint. This is something that changed, but it almost stayed the same until the end of the war. And it's this little leap here. This is something that the first 6,000 swords with the copper handle did not have. So before it was just the stick here. And I think the Japanese decided to change this because whenever you put this on the ground, it will stick more in the ground if it doesn't have this leaps here. So this gives it this little stand here to be able to just take it off, uh, take it off the ground and stand it on the ground. Uh, just make it easier. I've noticed in a lot of pictures, the soldiers were always have different type of belts. So sometimes they'll have to put the sword on the ground a lot of times. And this is something that was changed and it stayed almost until the end of the war. So I'll have the sword open now. And something I need to tell you guys about the Type 95 NCO swords is you, you don't need to open the swords. The swords are not signed and they weren't made in the traditional way of making Japanese swords. Even though they're just beautifully be decorated, um, there's you'll never find a signature. So there's no need to take them apart. So once again, this sword is just in beautiful condition, in mint condition in my opinion. And you can see the serial number here. Now, this serial number is a number that was given to each sword individually. So this is the number production of this sword with the top character right next to. Now, on some Japanese swords, the numbers will be like this. And on some of them, you read the numbers from the other side. And that doesn't mean the sword is not original. Let me zoom into the numbers there. And that, that, that is just varying from the different companies that made this sword. The blade is in um, really good condition. You always find this groove here. Some of them don't have it. This sword doesn't have a temper line. They are all machine made. They're not as thick and strong as the Chingonto traditionally made swords. Not even compared to the Chingonto uh, Type 98 swords that were made. They're more fragile. You can tell if you had the pleasure to have a Type 95 and a Type 98, you're immediately going to see the difference. The blades are thicker, they're heavier. This one's a little bit lighter. Once again, the materials used in this sword were the intention of this sword was to be creative, mass, massly created to supply a lot of Japanese soldiers with the sword. Also, do you find this, this characters, well, you find the serial number here, and you also find the serial number here for the scabber that means that this scabber belongs to that this or but during the war because they were both created together but during the war sometimes uh, soldiers would lose their scabber and use a replacement but a lot of the items were uh, put into different scabbers that's why you will find scabbers that have different serial numbers and of course in the collector's world that would devalue the price of the item because it's really not completely using a different scabbard for this sword. Also on the, something I forgot to mention also is on the first 6,000s, um, you'll find the serial number here on the Habaki instead of here. So that's one of the differences between later production and the copper handle production at the beginning of the war. So. I hope you guys learned a little bit with this video about Type 95 NCO swords. If you have other questions, just contact me down below. Um, I hope you guys like this video. Please like, share, and subscribe to my YouTube and check out my eBay store, the Samurai Monkey 42. Thank you so much for, for watching. Goodbye.